Thanks. Great. <clears throat> You'll see the mystery about that uh, volume adjustment in a minute. Um, so uh, um, how many of you um, took family histories on November 24th, Thanksgiving Day, AKA Family History Day? <laughs> One, that's what I thought. Um, so uh, I've been asked by the uh, committee to talk about um, a family history implementation uh, program. I think maybe for obvious reasons, uh, it's it's uh, not uh, done seldomly. Uh, it's not done often, and it's often not done well. Um, uh, so uh, to quote a famous leader of ours, uh, Kara Sang, uh, it's the best kept secret in healthcare family history. Uh, by the way, I, I, I presented some of this um, in June at the June meeting, and I was out of the room when this agenda item was was. Um, was put on the list, so I assume there was a, a method to the organizing committee, uh, committee's uh, strategy here to have me come back, and, and I'll talk about a somewhat expanded view of this project. Um, I think uh, uh, everybody in the room uh, understands the, um, uh, the obvious uh, opportunity in uh, capturing good family history information and using it effectively in uh, clinical medicine. Uh, we've been working um, on a project that we call the Genomedical Connection. Uh, since about 2004, uh, actually this project was, was conceived around 2000 or so, uh, and it took several years to uh, convince the Department of Defense to, to fund it, and this was obviously before we had uh, fancy machines to do uh, genome sequencing and, um, and limited genotyping. So, so uh, family history has been one of the projects that our group has been focused on for quite some time. Um, I show this slide mainly to illustrate the fact that um, we can get a lot more done in terms of implementing genetics, genomics, and things like family history outside of the university-affiliated uh, practices. And um, this is uh, Central North Carolina, um, Greensboro, um, some, somewhat known for uh, the furniture business and near High Point and so on, has been where we've been working with the Cone Health System on a family history project, and we've been working with other non-university-affiliated practices in uh, implementation and dissemination of genomic-related um, uh, strategies. Um, so this takes place in Guilford County. It's about 40 miles uh, west of uh, Duke University. Uh, our goal has been to recruit um, individuals from well visits from two high-volume primary care practices with a goal of enrolling 1,500 patients in this family history uh, study with a focus on education, integration to practice, and outcomes measures. I think um, it's clear that um, family history has got a number of, to take an accurate family history, has got a number of significant impediments to it in the context of a very brief primary care visit. Oftentimes the patients are not coming with the right information in hand. Even if they have the information, the, the, the clinicians are often confused about, um, about what that information really means and how to synthesize it into some recommendations, and it has been discussed. Uh, by several of you already, um, how this data gets into uh, health records um, is a little bit obscure, um, and also uh, how to uh, mobilize a family history-driven health plan is equally uh, challenging. And our um, premise has been that if we can use um, electronic media, um, internet-based uh, tool um, to have patients prepare their family history information pre-visit. Uh, and have this uh, synthesized and uh, integrated into a clinical decision support tool that enables the physician-patient interaction at the visit to really be focused on uh, what needs to be done, whether it's, whether it's nothing, genetic counseling or genetic testing, uh, might be a, um, a, pr a preferable way to uh, practice. And we've uh, developed a, uh, uh, a web-based family history tool we call Mitri um, that uh, can be accessed uh, through uh, the Internet, as I've mentioned, uh, when we were developing this tool uh, almost uh, 10 years ago, um, these were some of the guiding principles about ease of use, ability to actually use published guidelines for risk stratification, that we get the patient reports to be understandable by the, uh, the, the reports, rather, to be understandable by both the patients and, and the clinician, and that they drive a discussion at the visit around uh, the meaning of the family history information. Um, and we've uh, incorporated, as you can see, a multidisciplinary team uh, to implement this. So our uh, developed family history tool can, and platform uh, can um, capture data on 48 different diseases. We've been piloting this study in, in four different diseases, diseases that you see here, three cancers as well as uh, one uh, um, 
in, in um, vascular disease and thrombosis, and the reports that are generated are um, for both the patient and the provider. Um, We've used a number of sources uh, that I don't, won't go into detail here that are used and updated to develop the uh, uh, informatics and clinical decision support algorithms. This is an example of the report that the physician sees, so it very clearly states what the recommended actions are, the, why those actions are being recommended, and uh, what other um, uh, attributes of the patient um, might be considered, as well as the uh, sources of information that we use to generate those recommendations. The patient also sees a report that really, as I said, encourages them to have a dialogue about whatever risk information has been conveyed to them uh, with their physician and try to come to a decision about what should be done. Um, this particular um, family history uh, software has some attributes that we believe are um, at least uh, uh, different than some of the others that have been made available through uh, either the CDC, the Surgeon General, or the VA. So you can see uh, that this particular software allows for patient entry, does also name um, relatives in the family, uh, has decision support, and as we're illustrating in this project, can be integrated into the clinical workflow. So this could be one report that um, would be generated that would be a, a more traditional family history tree, but what our clinicians have told us is they don't like that, they don't understand it, they really want to see a tabular report uh, such as uh, uh, what uh, you see here. Um, we began this project uh, in earnest um, around 2006. Uh, we, we really wanted to understand the, the ability of patients to understand the information in such a report, so we did a number of pilot uh, surveys and cognitive um, assessments of the language with, uh, with the patient community, um, and we also uh, test drove it with uh, genetic counselors so that we could understand how that information might be integrated as well as how it was received uh, in the reporting. We also have got a team that has been um, uh, frequently looking at uh, clinical guidelines in the target areas and, um, and updating uh, the, the, the clinical decision support algorithms to be uh, concurrent with uh, current uh, recommended uh, recommendations for genetic counseling or genetic testing. And this is an implementation science uh, program, so we're really trying to measure outcomes uh, best as we can at both the patient provider and at the systems level. The first part of this that we've done the most work on is the process, really figuring out how do we, how it integrates into, into patient, into the clinician's workflow and the clinician environment as well as the um, uh, patient and physician satisfaction. Does it influence patient behaviors? Uh, does it, uh, is it a valid tool, um, and does it, uh, can it be um, also shown to have an, uh, an out, and um, can, can be shown to have an effect on, on outcomes uh, to, to generate clinical uh, utility and the like? So from an implementation science component, um, this is just a, a, a snapshot of some of the types of data that we're trying to capture, both at the patient level, the provider level, as well as the clinic level, and this is done in an iterative way to uh, uh, to ensure that we can achieve uh, something close to seamless integration with the appropriate uh, uh, workflow environment in which the tool has been placed. These are some of our early data on uh, patient um, acceptance of, of such a um, um, protocol, and you can see um, by far and away most patients are extremely satisfied with um, with using such a, uh, a tool in the context of clinical care. Uh, they're not threatened by um, the use of the internet or computers. Uh, they found that most of the software that we've um, uh, ended up using has been uh, very acceptable. Uh, surprisingly, the, the provider community, which in our early focus groups was somewhat resistant about having this sort of inserted into their environment, um, has been unbelievably supportive. Uh, they now believe that um, Family history is, is incredibly important. Uh, they believe it's improved their practice, made their practice easier. They're recommending it to their peers, and when this project ends, they're not sure what they're going to do without a funded uh, program to uh, continue, continue the, uh, the use of it in their program. So it's, uh, this was um, uh, very different than what we expected. Um, in the first uh, half of the cohort, as you can see, um, a more than expected number of referrals for genetic counseling and some for genetic testing, but we're having these uh, data reviewed by a completely uh, blinded group of genetic counselors to assess the clinical validity. So far, uh, these appear to be highly valid results with a sensitivity and specificity of greater than uh, 90 percent, uh, but uh, we, have, we need more data. Uh, and I thought 
given the fact, if I can figure out how to do this, uh, that this was uh, uh, around Thanksgiving, and I wanted to show you a, uh, a patient and provider perspective. Oops. Where is the mouse? There we go. Is that moving? No. There we go. We had a, a, um, a news station. Um, this is not going to work. OK. <laughs> Never mind. But, um, but we did have a, uh, a really poignant interview with uh, patients that were um, using this and how, how profound uh, effect it is of this knowledge that they had, which was empowering in terms of their behaviors um, that I wish I could show you. Uh, in addition to which the providers were saying how wonderful it was, as, uh, as the surveys indicate, to have uh, this as a, um, as a robust um, tool within their environment uh, uh, as well. So I'm sorry you couldn't see the, see the, uh, the video clip. But uh, as this summary indicates, we've um, enrolled about 1,000 patients. Um, I think I've said uh, most of this, but one of the things we're trying to achieve is, uh, is also not just how do we integrate this information into the clinical environment, but what's the model? for delivering the risk, capturing the information, delivering the risk information. And I can, you can imagine that this could be a prototype for some of the other ways that we not just use family history, but use other types of risk information, such as genetic risk information. So um, uh, in the future, and areas that I think we should be talking about perhaps in the breakout session later on, areas for collaboration is, is, is the incorporation of, uh, of additional risk information to the platform, whether it's new diseases that we're currently not studying or uh, new types of risk information such as uh, genetic uh, uh, and genomic testing. Uh, because this has been a DOD study, we're um, very keen to implement this, and so is uh, the DOD, into uh, the military uh, healthcare system, uh, which is one of the impetus, the impetus for the DOD funding was to create a model that they could actually use more broadly to broaden the decision support. We, we think that the use of uh, wireless technology to capture this information beyond just using a home-based uh, computer screen is going to be uh, incredibly important, and the use of text messaging to uh, set up reminders. Uh, so um, I think with that, I'll just stop and take some questions, and certainly those of you who are interested in family history um, can join us uh, in the breakout session. I just also wanted to mention that Mark Williams and Karis have both been doing family history projects, maybe several implementation projects such as this. You may want to add some comments to what I've said, but go ahead. Um, hi, uh, Umberto Villae from Marshfield. Uh, very, very interesting stuff. Couple of questions. Um, I'm one of those people that inherit that OCD, so I get a family history from my patients uh, when I see them. Um, Updating it becomes a challenge, and it seems like everybody updates it because nobody else reads somebody else's family history. Uh, I take it there's like a central repository that gets updated, and then everybody shares it. And then the, the other question is, on patients whose um, first-degree relatives were consented, they did not consent, but they get their care at Duke. How is that information enter, if at all, in their medical record? So on the first uh, question, it's, we have an aspirational goal to do what you just said, which is to have a centrally hosted uh, informa information repository for the family history, but that predi is predicated on having a, um, a, an electronic medical record that can uh, support that, and that just doesn't exist uh, today, but um, is something that we hope will be available in the future. And I would just say also, our view of this tool, um, this software, is that it should be centrally hosted and accessible to any practices that wish to use it. So we're trying to move in that direction, um, and we can talk about more, more of that later. Your second question was about the use of get, uh, gathering information from... Yeah, we, we're, not, um, so we're not linking that at this point. But again, it's a topic of discussion, and we hope to do, hope to do that. But again, it's, right now, this is a research protocol. Patients are consenting. Um, so we haven't gone out to consent the other members of a, of a, of a family. So um, to add an additional point to Umberto's and then ask a, a question following that, um, uh, we are uh, at Intermountain have developed a uh, family history data mart uh, where the representation of the pedigree structure, of course, will remain um, uh, set and is updatable. 
Um, but uh, we're using a, pr a primary collection tool, much as Jeff has described, uh, that would be deployed in primary care clinics. We also recognize that within specialty encounters throughout the system, different components of family history are collected that are relevant to that specialty. So uh, we've been exploring modules specific for cancer that would collect uh, more intensive cancer data, but it would all go back to this family history data mart. And so over time, you have an updated and enhanced family history for a much broader range of diseases that not only uh, hopefully will prevent the patient from having to answer the questions over and over and over again, uh, but will also uh, allow exploration of other um, associations that perhaps were not immediately apparent or, or not known. The other thing that I would potentially add for your moving forward bullet points uh, also relates, I think, to a bit to Umberto's question, which is the idea of exploring uh, social networking uh, between families to allow um, uh, family histories to be shared. Now, uh, granted, there are part of that research agenda would have to be exploring what's allowable under current privacy uh, regulations and under what circumstances it could be done. But we've certainly uh, had a lot of patients who have been extremely. Um, uh, and this may be a Utah-specific phenomena, uh, but they're, they're used to sharing genealogic information from family to family, and they don't find it um, upsetting to think about sharing fam uh, health information along that same sort of a model. And you can imagine this type of a distributed collection of family history where if, if it could all be captured uh, you know, within uh, a family, data, uh, family history data mart, uh, and would be available to multiple family members could rapidly increase the uh, speed at which this type of information could be collected and used. So I would like to uh, explicitly add that to the research agenda. Um, yeah, I, I think, well, first of all, clearly social networking is a component of how you actually get this information in the first place, but it's not on the as sophisticated a platform as probably the one you're envisioning. Um, but, uh, and I would also guess that um, Social networking as a as a uh, as a healthcare tool um, is worth worthy of, of discussion. But how do you deal with the myriad of privacy and and policy issues that have to go along with that is is probably a, a formidable agenda. But I'm not saying that it should stop us. But we should really consider those aspects. So, thanks, Mark. Uh, Mark Rutan, University of Chicago. Your discussion of family history <laughs> brings up an important policy issue, which is. For those of you who are not physicians here, um, you may not be familiar with the various levels of billing codes when you see patients. If one omits a family history, one cannot bill as a, at a level five for a new patient. If one doesn't review the family history, um, one can't review at a level five for an existing patient. So therefore, there's an implicit value that CMS has assigned to taking or reviewing a family history. It's $28 for a new patient, and it's $26 per visit for an existing patient. So it's an interesting policy opportunity to try and talk about the cost of taking and reviewing a family history as, as already accepted by CMS, mm -hmm. and then try and benchmark that against other uh, genomic interventions that we may choose to do. Yeah, and thanks for making Right. Now, I was going to say the same thing, except uh, it also is just illustrative of the thorny complexity of our reimbursement system and how it plays into this entire uh, area of risk assessment. Jeff, this is Mike Murray from Brigham. Um, we, we've been involved in several family history projects, um, and uh, you've broken through in one area where we just can't, which is the support of the primary care providers. And I think going forward, that's going to be essential since. Um, Patients have routinely told us stories such as the one patient who was enthusiastic, shared his family history, and his primary care doc said everybody dies of something, and then put the family history aside. So do you have any more granular feedback on <laughs> why your primary care providers are 
interested and enthused about this? Um, a couple of points. Uh, first of all, this goes to this, um, the discussion we had earlier about institutional leadership. So Tim Rice is the CEO of the Cone Health System. And as I said, it's, not a it's a community based uh, health system that has a far reaching catchment area. And Tim is very interested in having his community based system being known for its advances in genetics and genomics. So it's a very top down environment where um, a visionary uh, CEO is, at least in this area, has encouraged his community-based docs to at least put their toe in the water and see how it feels. And having done so, I think they, be they became adopters over the course of the first six months of this project, hearing the feedback from their patients uh, and seeing how, how much more effective and efficient, at least they felt they were being in the care of these patients, was huge. So, they, so our goal is to have these docs to be spokespeople and ambassadors for the rest of the community and, and even to bring it back to Duke, which is not, it's not currently happening at places like, like Duke for probably the similar types of reasons that you experience it uh, at Partners. Jeff, I might just, just ask in terms of, of integration with the medical record. We, Josh Denny from, from Vanderbilt did this nice summary of the, the f five initial eMERGE sites looking at completeness of data and, you know, 80 to 90 percent complete for medical, for medications and that. And it was like 20 percent complete for family history. Mm -hmm. And only two of the sites even could tell us how complete it was for family history out of the, out of the five. And I, I understand that Cerner is, is putting in a family history module. Could you comment on how we can get that done? Uh, so, first of all, there's, there may be others that are more familiar with uh, EMR integration and family history than I am. This, system, this group of practices does not currently have an integrated EMR, but they're moving in that direction. At, at Duke, we're working with EPIC, and that is um, one, of the, one of the topics with our CIO and the EPIC uh, integration team as to how do we move this into a centralized um, resource such as uh, an EMR. So do others have experience with Cerner or with other EMRs in which ha there has been success? Well, I know, that, Mark, you probably have, but that's, go ahead. Well, um, I'll just uh, start. I think that um, there are a couple of ways to skin this cat. I mean, one is uh, the ideal situation would be to um, uh, use the, uh, the EMR, but of course the, the challenge that we have in the EMR world right now, at least the vendor-based community, is it's all being driven off of meaningful use. So there's a group of us that have signed a letter that has gone to the advisory committee for meaningful use of the uh, uh, Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT to say, you need to move family history up from uh, the uh, phase three implementation to phase two implementation, which would actually get it on the radar screens of the vendor community uh, in the next year as opposed to three years from now. It is on the roadmap, uh, but it's down the road. So meaningful use will drive uh, integration of family history into electronic health records. Whether the level of functionality will be anything that would be useful is not clear to me. The second thing that we can use perhaps to get around this, however, is uh, through uh, patient portals or patient-controlled medical records uh, where there's much more innovation space. Uh, and the, if the data model is developed that is compatible with the um, uh, uh, electronic health record and data warehouse uh, storage capacity, that information could be inputted, you know, in a way that wouldn't necessarily have to involve interaction with the electronic health record, and messages to the clinician could be filtered back into the workflow uh, without having to uh, have family history represented as a true component of the electronic health record. So there's some opportunities to innovate around that potential roadblock. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Actually, one of the pilot projects we're running right now is the use of the patient portal to, uh, to, to um, capture the information. And then this uh, centralized, the, the information goes to a centralized server that hosts uh, the clinical decision support tool for family history and then flips a report outside of the EHR back to the doc which is not perfect, but it, it works. Okay, and Dan, before you comment, um, I'd like to ask Greg Firo, who's been involved in NHGRI's family history efforts for quite some time, too. So yeah, I just uh, sort of extend Mark's comments a little bit. Um, we uh, had uh, initiated the, uh, in conjunction with the U.S. Surgeon General, then it was Surgeon General Carmona, the uh, uh, My Family Health Portrait family uh, history tool, um, and part of our efforts over the last several years have been to drive development of family history data standards and adoption of those data standards in the context of electronic health records. So 
Currently, there exists a, what's called a core minimum data set for what EHR and PHR systems should be able to capture a minimum about family history. And there are HL7 data standards for movement of that information around um, HIT systems. Um, the extent to which that has been adopted has been very variable. Uh, commercial vendors, many of them already had some basic functionality around family history data capture, largely unstructured, and when it was structured, um, not structured in ways that other EHR systems could readily grab onto. That being said, I think Cerner is an example of a, uh, of a group that's looking at the HL7 model and has adopted it. I know Epic has worked with it. Um, there are some one-off uh, examples, I believe at UVA in the Harvard Partners system with uh, Jennifer Haas's project um, that have looked at integration of structured family history data. I think something to consider for this group is family history is viewed a little bit like genomic data in that there's a little chicken and egg phenomenon going on here with the vendor community, which is show me the benefit to the patients, get provider demand up, and we'll build the functionality and the data structure um, 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 that's necessary. And I think family history is an interesting proxy for a number of issues. Um, interoperability of data is key for family history as it is for genomic data. Issues around uh, consent and data sharing are um, important to consider. Version control, which was already brought up uh, earlier, um, it, it's a good proxy and an easy proxy for people to wrap their brains around about, so who's going to control annotations to the individual patient's genome in the medical record? Figuring out through family history first might be a way to go. Mm -hmm. So anyway, there's, there's lots, of, lots going on in that community. And, the meaningful use issue is a very interesting one. And that, of course, I think would be a much bigger driver than the $26 that CMS currently uh, is willing to pay for family history collection and data interpretation. Great. Thanks, Greg. Thanks. Dan? Um, nothing, nothing I'm about to say should be viewed as, as uh, excessively negative, but um, <laughs> do you have data on how many people have such small kindreds that they're not useful, that the, fam the effort that goes into the family history is not useful. That was question one. And the other question is, as I, as I, as I listen to the outcomes part, you know, we're taught in medical school that the family history is important, but beyond that, um, why it's important and where we should focus our efforts is not such a, a big emphasis. And it seems to me that the big payoff in your project so far has been to identify people who may have uh, family cancer syndromes. And so whether there is some value in f focusing the family history on parts where we have, I hate to say the word, actionability, um, <laughs> and, and, and not worrying about whether, uh, you know, great-grandmother had something that you don't actually know how to characterize, she died of cancer or something, or died of a heart disease or died of old age or whatever. So is there a way to focus the family history and, and bring it into the 21st century in terms of, of the kinds of information that we're, we're looking at? So um, we, we don't, we do have data, although I don't have the, um, the data for you on the uninformative uh, family history pedigrees that we've captured, but we, it, they're there, I'm sure. Um, and I, uh, I think you're right. I think we need to, I think the, the, the meat of this project is going to come uh, several years down the line, not just in, um, in, in, in understanding who has uh, at risk for familial cancer syndromes, but um, have any of their screening tests been informative and actually prevented something that, or, or earlier detect, or detected something earlier than otherwise would be. I should say, um, and I didn't mention this before, that a, a review of these particular practices for the years pre preceding this project um, showed zero referrals to genetic counselors by any of them. So um, presumably there, was a, there were a number of um, important familial syndromes missed up until now, and presumably we will be able to have data in the, in the, in the ensuing years on uh, the value of capturing that information. So just to extend that um, a bit, uh, obviously from Utah I can't comment on the small kindred question that you raised, Dan, but uh, <laughs> if we set that aside for a set of answers. And one of the things that really surprised me was how frequently this is being used in behavioral health that the, when they have a patient who comes in who's having some um, um, issues around depression or that sort of thing, 
They're taking family histories around depression, bipolar disorder to determine which medication should be used, how long should treatment uh, be maintained. Um, if it's a child, is this conduct disorder versus attention deficit disorder? Very innovative ways that intuitively make sense, but for which, of course, we have no data on whether or not that's appropriate or not. So the clinicians that are actively using family history are doing some very innovative things with it. And I think we, one of the things we should be doing is exploring more of tell us what you're doing, and then we can use tools um, uh, to enhance that. And I think that will also help with the issue that Michael raised about buy-in. So uh, I, I was responding to Dan's uh, comment about uh, how people use this information. Uh, what I tell our medical students is that, um, first of all, if you go to a cocktail party and you talk to somebody, very often the opening for, for conversation is something about the other person's family. So this is a way for the physician to get to know the person and their family a little bit. That's a side uh, value. But it, when it comes down to doing the pedigree, there's two challenges. One is to get all of the information and then how to separate the wheat from the chaff. And that's why I think getting it in tabular form, we ought to avoid that. It's the pedigree that actually allows you to say, well, it's great that Granny had, you know, whatever, but that's irrelevant to this problem at hand today. It just can't get, you just can't get there based on the pedigree. So I would urge, um, us to remember uh, genetic principles. So the 21st century model of the family history, I think uh, there won't be an insignificant family history because there's going to be a flip here where we've been using family history forever to, as a proxy for genetics. And now with genomics, we're going to be using it as a context for genomics. So um, when we're thinking about the whole genome sequencing, we're not thinking about it doing it on any patients at this point unless family members are involved. So, so putting those novel variants into uh, context, but kind of the transition between what we're doing now and then is where we're at. On that, but we do need to, to move on. So we have Debbie, Murugu, and Dave, and then that'll be it, okay? I, I was just going to bring up the context of I think family history is, is really important, and I agree that focusing on sequencing in families is, is extremely important right at this juncture. But I think we need to think about how are we going to get at de novo mutations that occur every generation in our, in our population? and how they contribute to disease, right? I mean, this is an important question. They are genetic. Uh, if they arise, they will be passed on. I mean, can we begin to address that if we more systematically study family history? So is, are you saying um, that the somewhat of an interim holy grail is to link family history with uh, genomic sequencing information so they're all in the same space that we can begin to look at um, how generational sequence, how, how, how genomes are, are changing over generations and also what is happening phenotypically. I mean, I, I don't, no one I think here believes that family history trumps or is a substitute for sequencing or vice versa, that the two pieces of information need to go hand in hand, which is what I think yeah, you're at least... I'm also saying that if there's no family history, Absolutely. That doesn't not. mean that doesn't, doesn't mean, mean that, right. uh, they could. So, I mean, we need to be able to look at different models for right. how uh, DNA can impact disease. Murugan Mangum from Ohio State. Um, kind of spinning on a couple different things here. I think part of this is, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not just genetics, though, it's learned behavior. It's learned behavior of how you eat, how you exercise. You get that from your family, you get that from your parents, and you get that from your social networks. And family history can get that information too. And so if we get beyond just looking at the genetic information, there's a lot of other things that are in there. I mean, people get heart attacks in their 50s or 60s, but it could be just as easily from their diet as it is from their genetics. And so in addition to getting the genetic information, the learned behavior portion is still going to be there even after we have sequencing information available. So my, my comment to that is just as there are a myriad of family history tools, that, of some of which we've seen here today, uh, there is an equal number, if not more, of health risk assessment tools that um, beckon the clinician to try to capture 
lifestyle information, behavioral information, diet, and so on, that um, could be integrated into this uh, as well to con create a more complete picture of what's going on with the individual and their family. And physicians generally don't have the time to capture that information on their own. I'd just like to say uh, this is an absolutely critical issue as we go to paperless uh, wards, which we're all reaching right now, it's just not easy to record, to, to obtain and record a, a pedigree on the wards, and we need to come up with some easy, uh, effective, uh, and electronic way to do this. So please join the breakout group uh, this afternoon, David. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thanks. Discussion.